Let me begin this lecture by reminding you briefly of where we've been in this middle section of our course, which, as you know, has been centered around the dual themes of development and homeostasis. We began with a series of lectures about gene regulation and cell signaling to provide us with some background about how the activities of different kinds of cells in a multicellular organism can be regulated and coordinated. We then went on to look in some detail at mechanisms by which a complex multicellular organism can develop from a single cell. After we, after we had learned uh, something about how multicellular organisms are built, so to speak, we then moved on to learn how various parts of an organism communicate with each other and coordinate their activities, all in the broad context of uh, maintaining homeostasis, or a constant internal environment, as Claude Bernard called it. Much of the material we've covered in this middle third of the course has been focused on animal systems, although we've seen in the last couple of lectures how the same principles may apply in plant systems as well, albeit with some interesting twists. We've seen how all organisms, plants, animals, you name it, possess molecular, cellular, and physiological adaptations that promote survival, and ultimately from an evolutionary per uh, perspective that promote reproductive success by contributing to an organism's ability to make the best of the environment in which it finds itself. We've also introduced the idea that behavior, the behavior of organisms, represents perhaps the most highly elaborated uh, kind of adaptation available to achieve this end. Today, in the final lecture of this middle third of our course, I want to elaborate on this de uh, idea. Specifically, I want to look in a little more detail at how organisms respond to their environment. That is, we'll look at how organisms act on the information they receive in an adaptive way, in order to further develop the idea that their behavior can be seen in part as kind of a homeostatic mechanism. Now, at the core of this discussion is, um, is going to be the relationship between a stimulus, that is, a piece of information that an organism has available to it, and a response, that is, the behavior that occurs as a result of receiving the information. The ideas of stimulus and response aren't new to us. These ideas have appeared throughout our discussion of development and homeostasis, but today we want to place these ideas more squarely in the context of thinking about how organisms behave. Now, one last general point. Usually, when we think of the word behavior in a biological context, we think about animals and animal behavior. The reason for this, of course, is because animals move, and the ability to move is associated with an elaborate set of adaptations for obtaining, processing, and acting on information. As we saw in the last lecture, plants and other kinds of non-mobile uh, organisms also can respond to environmental stimuli, and they also have evolved mechanisms for obtaining, processing, and acting on information. Nonetheless, even the most devoted botanist has to agree that the vast majority of adaptations we would refer to as behavior occur in animals simply because they have the nervous systems and the ability to move. Thus, in this lecture, we're going to return to our animal-centered perspective as we discuss behavior. Now, let's begin by considering some uh, of the uh, same kinds of fundamental relationships between um, a stimulus and a response as we looked at last time when we considered how plants orient to light. Now, plants generally are rooted in one location, and therefore their responses to stimulus necessarily depend on patterns of growth and development. Animals being mobile respond to external stimuli largely by movement. That is, in the simplest case, animals move towards positive stimuli and they move away from negative stimuli. Consider, for example, an organism called a sow bug. This is uh, a little isopod crustacean. Okay? You may be familiar with sow bugs. They, you find them aggregated under damp logs, say under wood or rocks, something like that. Now, if you take a sow bug and you expose it to dry conditions, what you'll see is that the animal becomes very active Literally, it starts running around. If that individual encounters a damp spot, a place where there's mo more moisture, it starts to slow down. It ceases to move as much. This kind of simple behavior is actually called a kinesis, which comes from a root meaning movement. A kinesis is not directional, but it has the same effect in the long run of bringing an organism, an animal, closer to a preferred stimulus and farther from an undesirable one. In sow bugs, increased movement is triggered by the undesirable stimulus of being too dry. And so if the animal increases its movement, 
it's more likely than not to eventually run into some place that's more damp. If it decreases its movement when it runs into a damp place, it's more likely than not to stay in the damp place. And in this way, this kind of kinetic response is really the simplest relationship between stimulus and response that we see in an animal's behavior. Well, now let's take this one step further and let's consider um, a, a planarian. This is a small kind of flatworm. You often play with these in high school biology classes, dissecting them and bisecting them in different ways. Now, if you take a planarian, and you put it in a dish that's illuminated from one side, it will face the, t the source of light and actually move towards it. We call this kind of behavior a taxis. And in fact, the planarian moving towards light is exhibiting something that we would call phototaxis. It basically means movement towards light. The fact that animals are capable of these oriented movements, bringing them closer or farther away from desirable stimulus, isn't surprising, given what we know about their sensory, neural, and motor capabilities. The planarian, for example, has two light-sensitive organs, which we call eye spots, that are located symmetrically on either side of the animal's head. Now, these eye spots don't resolve images in any way, say, as, for example, our own eyes do, but they do detect the relative intensity of light. Thus, what the organism has to do in order to be able to orient to light is to keep moving in, a, in different directions until the intensity of light received by both of the eye spots on either side of the head is approximately equal. As long as the animal keeps moving in the direction that maintains this equal intensity of light on either eye spot, it will naturally orient to the light. Now, Actually, as it turns out, if the system is that simple, it could also be moving away from the light, but presumably as the light gets dimmer and dimmer, something will happen. It'll turn around and it'll start going the other way. Now, you can actually demonstrate this, and this is another one of these high school experiments that are often done when you put lights on sides of Petri dishes that you've put planarians in and watch the way they orient to that. These kinds of kinesis, such as we see in sow bugs or taxis, such as we see in planaria, represent the re simple relationships be between stimulus and response that defines sort of the most fundamental unit of behavior. The only major difference between kinesis and taxis that we see in animal and tropisms, such as we discussed in plants last time, is that plants orient to desirable stimuli by growing towards them, whereas animals can move towards them. Now, given the complex sensory, neural, and motor mechanisms that are available to animals, we actually expect much more from them. We expect them to be able to take more intricate kinds of information, process it in more interesting ways, and create behavioral responses that are much more complex in response to this information. You only have to spend a few hours out in nature, or even just a little time watching a nature show on TV, to appreciate how complicated the behaviors of animals might be. Yet, even for more complex behaviors, we often find that animals behave as though they are making very simple responses to equally simple sensory cues. Let me illustrate what I mean with a favorite example of mine. This involves the behavior of a kind of bird called the northern flicker. This is a very common kind of woodpecker found in the United States. Now, the courtship behavior of the flicker was studied by a biologist named G. Kingsley Noble, who was the director of the American Museum of Natural History in New York in the 1940s and did a lot of important work in the field of animal behavior at the time. Now, the two species of this, the two sexes of this species of flicker actually look pretty much alike. The major difference between the male and the female is that the male has on the side of its head a black set of feathers sort of running away from the mouth, a, a patch of feathers that are commonly called the mustache. Females look pretty much like the male, but they lack the mustache. Now, Noble was interested in the kinds of sensory cues that these animals, these flickers, use to recognize each other in their social interactions, and he did the following experiment. He found mated pairs of flickers, that is, males and females, that had already paired up, that were jointly defending a territory, and maybe even had built a nest together. Then he captured the female from one of these pairs, and he would paint a mustache on the side of her head using a removable black paint. Now, what Noble found was that when he let the female go, she would return to the territory, the territory of the male to which she was mated to, 
But the male wouldn't recognize her. In fact, the male would treat this female as though she was a male, attacking it very aggressively and driving it off. The male did this even if these individuals had already made it together. Apparently, the male uh, completely ignored any other cues that were coming from this animal and paid attention to only the one cue of the black mustache. Interestingly enough, when Noble, fortunately for the female, recaptured her and removed the black mustache and returned her to the territory, the male responded to her as though nothing had happened. All he was paying attention to was this black mustache. Now, this result should seem surprising to us. Remember, these, this male and the female have been intimately associated, have been interacting in very complex ways. But this single simple feature was enough to completely determine whether the male would be aggressive or not to the female. This example of the behavior of flickers is representative of the way that many kinds of animal behaviors are triggered by a single simple cue. Simple cues that trigger behaviors in this way are called sign stimuli. Uh, this, they're called this because they're simple signs, little cues, signs, that serve as stimuli for particular kinds of behavior. These kinds of cues are often sometimes called releasers, and that's because they're stimuli that release particular behaviors. Sign stimuli are very common in animal behavior. Many aspects of an animal's behavior, including those involving mating, finding shelter, building a nest if you're a bird, and so forth, can be triggered by simple sign stimuli. Now, what's interesting about sign stimuli and what's important to our discussion is the fact that they demonstrate how animals often ignore much of the sensory information available to them and rely only on a single simple cue to trigger a very complex suite of behaviors. In other words, animals only use and respond to a very small subset of what they could respond to, of the sensory information available to them, perhaps as little as just one feature like a black patch on the side of the head. Now, why do they do this? Why doesn't the animal take in and process all the information it possibly can? Well, the reason in general is because there's too much information to process, and so selection should act on the animal to only select certain kinds of information that are particularly important. And in fact, for some behaviors, only one little bit of information might matter. It might be more adaptive for example, for the male to ignore everything else, look at one cue which tells him, usually, that this is a male on his territory, another individual who's a competitor and who he should respond aggressively to. Normally, females aren't caught and they don't have their black, uh, black mustaches painted on them. So there's no reason that selection should act on the male to be able to detect this kind of manipulation. So by exclusive, f focusing exclusively on just one particular cue, in this case the cue that distinguishes males from females, the individual is able to do the right thing most of the time very efficiently. Now, what about the response side of this relationship? Complex animals, like birds or other vertebrates or many other animals, certainly have the neural and the motor capabilities to produce highly flexible and complex behaviors in response to the stimuli they receive. But here, too, we often see that many aspects of how, an anim of how animal behavior is expressed sometimes appear much simpler than we would expect it to be. Let me tell you about one study that was done by a very well-known behavioral biologist um, named Conrad Lorenz. Actually, R Lorenz is a very important um, uh, founder of the field of animal behavior known as ethology and won part of the Nobel Prize in 1973 for experiments like the uh, and observations like the one I'm about to describe to you. Now one of the species that Lorenz did a lot of work on was a European species of goose called the gray lag goose. These geese nest on the ground. They make their nest by scraping out a little depression in which they lay their eggs. Now, these nests that geese make, these, these geese make, are relatively unsubstantial. And what happens is that the eggs that are laid in this nest by the goose, by the female goose, sometimes are knocked out of the nest accidentally. When this happens, not surprisingly, the female goose, who's sitting on the nest incubating the eggs, will reach out. She extends her long neck out and reaches over the edge of the nest and uses her bill essentially as kind of a, of a scoop or a ladle to kind of push the egg, pull the egg back into the nest. Now, 
Lorenz was working on this problem because he was interested, like Noble was, in the kinds of sensory stimuli that would trigger this behavior and found, for example, that it was just the oval shape of the egg or um, other aspects of the egg that served as sign stimuli for triggering this, releasing, uh, the, this retrieval behavior. But in the course of this work, Lorenz also noticed that every time the female goose retrieved an egg from the outside of the nest, pulling it back in, she did so in an almost identical fashion. The female goose reaches out, puts the underside of its bill on the far side of the egg, and then slowly pulls its neck back while waving its bill slightly from side to side. These side to side motions help keep the oval egg from rolling off to one side or the other as the goose draws it back in. Now, Lorenz noticed two very important things about this behavior. The first, as I said, was the fact that it was highly stereotypic. The manner in which the goose extended its neck and retracted it and moved its bill was essentially the same every time it performed the behavior. Secondly, Lorenz noticed that once this egg retrieval behavior was begun, it continued to completion regardless of whether the goose still had the egg under its beak or not. So, for example, sometimes the egg would slip away, but the female goose would continue the pulling back and rocking motion of its bill, even though there was no egg there. Or sometimes Lorenz would, Lorenz would experimentally remove the egg after the female had started this, and she wouldn't stop. It's as though she didn't know that the egg was gone. Once the behavior was triggered, it completed its progress the same way each time. Again, many kinds of animal behaviors involved in all sorts of, uh, all aspects of what animals do, including mating and so forth, actually exhibit this same kind of invariant all or none response. Lorenz called these kinds of behaviors fixed action patterns. Now, fixed action patterns is not a term that's used much in behavior anymore because it implies that the behavior is triggered completely identically each time. And in fact, there's some variation. But nonetheless, it's almost the same every time. And more importantly, once triggered, it goes to completion. Now, what's interesting about the existence of fixed action patterns, and important to us for our discussion, is the fact that they again demonstrate how the expression of an animal's behavior often fails to make use of the enormous flexibility we would think possible. Even if the egg rolls away in mid-retrieval, the goose continues on as though nothing had happened. Now, presumably, under most circumstances where fixed action patterns have evolved, this invariance of the behavior somehow is more adaptive than having flexibility. For example, perhaps the behavior can be executed more quickly, or perhaps it can be executed while the animal is paying attention to something completely different. For example, the female goose may really be paying attention to whether there's a predator around the nest as opposed to whether there's an egg there. So the behavior of the fixed action pattern is triggered, works to completion. If there's no egg, she just notices that later and tries again. Now, there's one more point we need to add to this mix. And that is this view of behavior as an adaptive trait, as a trait that ultimately increases the reproductive success of animals, implies that, some, that aspects of behavior can be selected for by natural selection. Certainly, the kinds of specificity and invariance of sign stimuli and fixed action patterns that we see in many behaviors lend themselves to being viewed as adaptations in the same way as physiological processes or, or organs or pieces of morphology might be viewed as kinds of adaptation that are selected for by natural selection. Indeed, in his book, The Origin of the Species, Darwin himself devoted a whole chapter to the point that behaviors can evolve just like any other trait and should be essentially viewed as though they were organs. But the idea that adaptive behaviors can evolve as a consequence of natural selection requires us to assume that the expression of behavior is under the control of genes somehow. We know that evolution occurs through changes in gene frequency in population. This suggests then for adaptive behaviors to evolve, they must have some genetic basis. Now, the idea that the expression of behavior may have genetic underpinnings often has been considered quite controversial.
This is probably because our own human experience suggests that behavior is highly flexible and contingent on learning and, and um, the input of all sorts of stimuli and information we have available. And it's challenging for us, some of us, to accept the idea that something like behavior can be genetically determined or even have any kind of strong genetic component. But it's clear in some examples that behavior can be strongly influenced by genetics. Let me give you another classic example, a classic study in animal behavior that illustrates this point. Several species of, of, a, of a group of small African parrots, which are commonly known as lovebirds. These are actually birds that you can um, uh, obtain in pet stores. These lovebirds um, normally build their nests in tree cavities. And they line their nests using thin strips of leaves that they've cut off of the trees around them. The birds cut these strips of leaves with their beaks, and then they fly back to, to their nest and use these leaves to line and make their nest. Now, if you raise these birds in the laboratory, what they'll use if they don't have leaves available are newspaper, strips of paper, and they'll use their beak again to cut off little strips of paper that you make available to them and build their nests out of these strips of paper. Now, different species of lovebirds perform this behavior in different ways. For example, a species called the fisher's lovebird cuts relatively long strips and carries these strips back in its beak. It flies back to the nest in its beak. There's another species called the peach-faced lovebird, which cuts shorter strips and performs an unusual behavior. Once it's cut the strip that it wants out, it turns its head around and tucks that strip into its tail feathers, and then it flies back to the nest with the strip carried in the tail. Now, in the early 1960s, a behavioral biologist named Bill Dilger, who was working at Cornell University, mated individuals of these two species with each other and examined the nest-building behavior of the hybrid offspring that were produced. What Dilger found was that the hybrids performed an intermediate form of the behavior. These hybrids would first uh, cut an intermediate length string, not uh, strip, not long or short, but right in the middle, and then they would turn their head to the side to try to tuck the strip into their tail, as the peach-faced lovebird did, but they would also try to hold it in their beak, as the fisher's lovebird would, and literally would try to fly back to their nest with their beak holding a strip uh, bending around towards their tail, a very awkward position. The intermediate behavior of these hybrids, hybrids illustrates how the phenotypic differences in behavior must have some underlying genetic differences between, must be the, the result of some underlying genetic differences between the two species, with hybrids getting genes from both species and coming up with a kind of hybrid behavior. Now, since Dilger's classic work, there have been many studies demonstrating similar genetic uh, expression of complex behaviors. There's an important caveat to add here, however. Even the simplest behaviors are complex traits from an evolutionary point of view, and like most complex traits, their development is almost certainly influenced by many genes, not just one. Now, in fact, there are examples, many of them in simpler organisms, simpler animals, of behaviors that are known to be controlled by differences in a single gene, but in the majority of cases, behaviors like the nest-building behavior of lovebirds certainly are complex, multigenic traits. I mention this point because there's a growing tendency, especially in the popular press, to talk about the discovery of a gene that seems to control, and I use that word in quotes, the expression of very complex behavioral traits. For example, um, the behavior of a trait like depression in humans might be um, uh, one that we could talk about. Now, usually these kinds of reports and discussions are based on the finding that the presence or absence of some particular allele for a gene, a mutation in a gene, correlates with the expression of some behavior. In other words, the presence or absence of an allele might correlate with something like the propensity for depression to be expressed in an individual. But usually these correlations are quite low. Therefore, we can't assume and shouldn't jump to the conclusion that genes control behavior. Even if we admit that there are genetic underpinnings to behavior, we wouldn't want to take the next step necessarily without more careful work to ascribe the expression of behavior to a single gene. Do these kinds of findings we've discussed provide evidence that behavior is influenced by genetic? Yes, genetics, yes, it certainly does.
But it's usually an overinterpretation to claim that a single particular gene controls or determines a complex behavior. Well, now, with that caveat, I want to shift gears just a little bit more and talk about one more aspect of behavior, because, uh, which is really the opposite side of the coin of what we've been talking about. Up to this point in the lecture, I've emphasized how even complex behaviors like nest building in lovebirds or egg retrieval in great gray lag geese can involve a remarkable lack of flexibility on the part of animals and in fact can give evidence of a remarkably strong degree of uh, uh, genetic uh, contribution to the expression of that behavior. But in many other cases, animals exhibit an equally remarkable amount of flexibility in the way they express their behavior, responding in different ways to complex suites of cues. Even in cases where a behavior may seem particularly hardwired, there's often the potential for some adjustment uh, and fine-tuning of the behavior. In fact, in the case of um, uh, Bill Dilger's lovebird hybrids, what he found was that after a year or two, these hybrid offspring that were not able to build nests because they couldn't figure out how to fly with the strip of paper both held in their bill and tucked in their tail, would eventually start to figure it out and would modify their behavior. So even in the case of, of the lovebirds where we can show a, a strong genetic contribution to the behavior, there's the potential for modification. The ability of a response to a stimulus to be modified by prior experience or current conditions is another hallmark of animal behavior. And as I said, it's the opposite side of the coin. Indeed, for every example we might cite of an inflexible behavior that appears to have a strong genetic basis, we can find as many or more examples of behaviors that depend on learning and um, response to the environment for the control of their expression. Clearly, the ability to learn and modify behavior as a result of experience and in, in response to stimuli is often highly adaptive as well. And this leaves us with another question about how to think about the adaptive nature of behavior, which is this. Why should an animal's behavior be inflexible in some examples, while it's very flexible and modifiable by learning in other cases? Well, the answer to this question has to be considered in terms of the adaptive advantage of the behavior in question and whether this adaptive advantage is enhanced by inflexibility or flexibility. Consider, for example, the predator avoidance behavior of kangaroo rats. Rattlesnakes and other snakes prey on kangaroo rats at night. These rattlesnakes are very fast in their strike and they're very effective predators. They sneak up silently on the rodent and take it with a very lightning fast movement. Kangaroo rats, in turn, respond to the very subtle sounds made by the lunging motion of the snake. And they respond in a highly stereotypic fashion with a very powerful jump upwards and backwards, a move that, by and large, usually takes them out of harm's way. Now, in this particular case, the inflexibility and invariance of this behavior makes a lot of sense. There's not a lot of opportunity to learn in this case. One mistake, and the rodent is eaten. As soon as a rodent goes out into the environment, as soon as the kangaroo rat is out in the environment, it has to get it right pretty much every time. But in other cases, just the opposite could be true. In some circumstances, an animal will benefit most if it can respond in different ways depending on the details of its immediate circumstances. We're going to return to the adaptive nature of behavior again in the last third of our course in the context of the discipline of behavioral, behavioral ecology and the way that organisms make use of the limited energy and resources they have available in ways that will maximize their reproductive success. And at this point of the course, we're going to see just the opposite. We're going to see how animals behave differently in very subtle ways depending on differences in their circumstances. So much so that we often refer to the kinds of behavioral differences that we see in animals as decisions. Well, whether or not animals are making decisions in the way that we would think of decision making in a human sense, um, we nonetheless are prompted to think about ourselves for a moment as we think about the adaptive nature of behavior. Because we know that we respond very flexibly to the world around us. We behave in very complex ways. Where did this ability to behave in such a complex and flexible way, to learn as well as we do, come from? Ultimately, as biologists, we have to presume that these abilities are adaptive, 
that at some point in our evolutionary history, the ability to respond as flexibly as we do, to create mental states, to have what we, in our own personal experience, would refer to as a mind, must have had some adaptive value that increased our reproductive success. This is a bit of a disquieting notion, but from the perspective of, bio of a biologist, it has to be true to some extent. At least the biological origins of what eventually led to our own human mind with all of its wonderful manifestations must have had something to do with the way that this mind allowed us to maintain our own internal environment, to make the best of our external environment, and to ultimately increase our reproductive success.